Good morning and welcome to Harvest Community Church. We're so thankful for your presence here with us this morning. Thank you for getting here early. Uh, for those in the lobby, we want to invite you to come on in and get a seat so we can get started right at 10 o'clock. So again, thank you so much for being here early. I don't know about you, but uh, this is my favorite time of year, the fall. And, and you know, the, the, the dog days of summer is coming to a close and uh, you get, you've kind of forgot there's mountains back there and that, you know, everything gets a little bit clear and it's, it's just, it's just a great time when, uh, uh, and, and seasonally that it finally starts cooling down. Well, not yet, but hopefully, I know this week it's gonna get cooled down and it's just a great season. And, you know, uh, kids are back in school and I know for some of us, uh, that's a relief. And for some, it's just an exciting time because it's a new, it does represent a new school year of newness. So yeah, I, I, I just really enjoy this time. Plus there's football too. That's always fun to watch <laughs> if our teams would win. <laughs> But yeah, this, this is just a wonderful time of year. And I, and I hope as you look at the mountains and, and look at the beauty outside, because it, it, it is going to be beautiful this week, just that you reflect, reflect on God's glory and His, His grace and presence in your life. This morning we'll be celebrating communion, and as we do so, uh, it's, it's just my prayer that, that we have a sense that God's here with us, that Jesus is here. Uh, and, 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 and so especially as uh, we will have probably have a moment of silence, just just to reflect on it, that rather than just reflect on us and just all the good or bad we may have done, but just that God's with us, you know, and, and, and that's enough, you know, just, and just to reflect on his presence. So uh, looking forward to that time this morning. And I know as we, we start in the fall, it's, it's kind of the, I know a lot of small groups have, have kind of kicked up back in the gear. And so if you're not part of a small group, uh, let the leadership know, because we'd love to get you uh, connected, whether it's the youth group, young adult group, college, or, or um, just lo uh, by location, we have small groups that way too. Well, again, good morning and welcome to Harvest Community Church and really appreciate your presence with us here this morning and thank you for being on time. <laughs> it's just awesome for you to be here. So, so thank you for that. And uh, we want to start off this morning with our call to worship. This morning, our call to worship comes from Psalm 100, a psalm for giving thanks. Make a joyful noise to the Lord, all the earth. Serve the Lord with gladness. Come into his presence with singing. Know that the Lord, he is God. It is he who made us, and we are his. We are his people and the sheep of his pasture. Enter his gates with thanksgiving and his courts with praise. Give thanks to him, bless his name. For the Lord is good, his steadfast love endures forever, and his faithfulness to all generations. Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Harvest. We're going to worship the Lord together, just as that psalm encourages us to worship the Lord with joy and with praises. Let's all stand up. We're going to sing a newer song, and you might have heard it on the radio a couple times. I don't know. It's, but it is a solid declaration of the gospel. God so loved the world that he gave his only son. Uh, I think that's from a fairly well-known Bible verse, I think. <laughs> so let's, uh, let's uh, join together. Um, let me pray for us as we begin. Father, thank you for this day that we can, can come together to worship you. We pray that our, we would release our, our, our burdens, our cares to you, uh, the burdens of the weak, uh, the burdens of this world, and, and just bask in your love and, and your gospel um, that transforms us from the inside out. So we pray, Lord, as we begin this day of worship, that it would be com committed solely to you to glorify you. In Jesus' name, amen. Come on. 
I'm all you weird. Clap along with us if you want. Come all you weary. Come all you weary. Come all you thirsty. Come to the well that never runs dry. Drink from the water. sinners come find his mercy come to the table he will satisfy taste of his goodness find what you're looking for for god so loved the world that he gave us his one and only son to save us whoever believes We'll live forever. Bring all your failures. Bring all your failures. Bring all your addictions. Come lay them down at the foot of the cross. Jesus is waiting there with open arms. For God so loved the world that He gave. One and only Son to save us Whoever believes in you Live forever For God so loved The world that he gave us His one and only Son to save us Whoever believes in you Will live forever
chosen seed. He chosen seed of Israel's race. He ransomed from the fall. Hail him who saves you by his grace and crown him Lord of all. Hail him who saves you by his grace. Why don't you go ahead and have a seat? Again, good morning and welcome to Harvest Community Church. I'm just so thankful for your presence here with us this morning. You know, as we gather in Christ's name, each person here brings a, 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 more, a greater presence of God. And so I'm just really thankful for you being here and just really excited about this fall season that we're embarking on. Weather's going to get cooler this week, so that'll be kind of nice to, to really feel like we're getting, finally getting into the fall season. So thankful for, for, for that as well. We want to start out with, with pointing out that under the chair in front of you, there's a connect card. And uh, go ahead and fill it out, especially if you're visiting with us. We ask that you fill out this connect card. Um, and if you have any prayer requests, we have a prayer team uh, that gets together monthly and also through the week on, on their own. We, we, we lift up these prayers on your behalf. And so, you know, if you have anything you want prayer for, we want to encourage you to uh, fill out the connect card. Or if you're visiting with us, please let us know who you are so we can get to know you a little bit better. And if there's any uh, ministries that you're interested in, we could get in contact with you as that, for that as well. A uh, reminder for Orchard, uh, this afternoon, our Women's Ministry Orchard will host a discipleship event. One of the things that we've been trying to do here at Harvest is uh, encourage discipleship. And so really important meeting this afternoon. And we have a very, very special speaker. Uh, our own very own Jenny McGill will be uh, talking about discipleship. And so uh, really cool. Uh, all ladies are invited and they want to be to make sure that even college age and um, even high school for you young, young ladies that are interested in coming, come on out. I think it's going to be really good. So can't encourage you more to attend that. Seniors Bible, if you want fun and the God's word and good food all at once, Come join the Seniors Bible this Thursday at 11 a.m. And for more information, you can see Ron Lynn for that. Uh, for Couples Garden, I'm going to ask Brian to come up real quick to give us a quick announcement. Thank you, Al. So my name is Brian. I am part of a team for Couples Garden. And last week, I shared a little bit about our event coming this coming Friday. And I want to give a little more detail about what the topic is going to be. 
and our very own Jin Lee. She is a licensed marriage family therapist, and she'll be giving a talk on empathy. And one of the important skills of empathy is something that you can learn. And I realized over my life that I wasn't conditioned naturally to be able to give, in, give empathy or even receive empathy. But one of the things that's important for my wife, Bernice, and I is to have empathy for our kids. And we asked Jen for some tools of how do we give empathy to our children, especially when they're feeling angry or sad or, or not. So she gave us a few tools. And just recently this Friday, I was blessed with a moment with my special, my, my young one, Bryson, who is three years old. And what happened was he was building using these little magnet tile things or something. And he says, Daddy, I'm sad. I said, what happened? He says, I broke it. So what I did, according to Jen, as I kind of went down on my knees and looked him in his eyes, I said, I'm sad too. And I said, aw. I said, you work very hard. And he said, I worked hard. And we had this special moment. It was, it was a really, really neat moment. And one of the things I learned is that this empathy is a skill that applies to all aspects of our life, whether it's our children, if it's our work, our, our friends, our family, um, especially our marriages. It may look different depending upon what stage the child is at, right? Or if they're in college or if they're a grown adult, it looks different. And it also looks different for our spouses, of course, right? But so this skill of empathy is a foundation that we'll learn for Friday, how it can apply to all aspects of your life. So whether you're, you're okay with your empathy, if you wanna fine tune it, um, please come join us on this Friday. We like to RSVP by Tuesday because we have to order food and childcare will be provided. And our dear Jessica will be helping out with our kiddos. So we invite you to come. Any questions, give us a, an email or talk to myself or Donna. Uh, you'll probably see an evite come out or you can also RSVP by the email. So any questions, let us know. Thank you. Awesome, thank you, Brian. Young adults uh, will be meeting uh, next Sunday, October 10th and October 24th. Uh, the, the meetings are right after church here, so uh, want to continue encouraging adults to come on out for that. Baby dedication. Uh, for our service on October 17th, so that's in two weeks from today, uh, uh, we're going to have a baby dedication. And so if you want to learn more about what that means, have a baby dedication, talk to Pastor Kevin. He'd love to talk to you. And, and uh, if you're, anyone else is interested, again, please talk to Pastor Kevin. Uh, and last but not least, we have a community service project update. And for that, I'm gonna ask C. Lee to come up on stage. Good morning, Harvest. God is so amazing. I just wanna say thank you so much for participating in our Families Forward food drive in September. Some of you brought canned goods every Sunday, and some of you donated money to purchase um, canned goods. And many of you joined us last Sunday for our first community service project here at Harvest Community Church. It was just so fun and exciting and such a successful event. I loved seeing all the ages that came out from the little ones to our valuable seniors. Um, we had Kylie um, in charge of putting away the shopping carts and her brother Tyler helping the adults um, pack the vans. Um, and the rest of you just kind of pitched in and organized us all. So it was wonderful and I thank you so much. Um, Jack, our very own Jack Ratana put together a wonderful recap of last Sunday and we'd love to share that with you.
you so much, Jack. That was wonderful. I love seeing that. Um, so I just wanted to give you just some numbers. We had about 75 of you come out and join us to go shopping. Um, and we started off with $500 seed money from Dwayne and Juliet. And you all tripled that amount. We spent $1,600 on food for our neighbors at Families Forward. Give yourselves a pat on the back. And I know it's more than that because on Sunday, the other Sundays prior, you, you also donated canned goods and also money. So thank you so much. And because um, we, were shop we shopped at Grocery Outlet in Woodbridge, and so because it's a discount store, we actually saved an additional $1,500. <laughs> Um, and um, the owners of the grocery outlet store are our brother-sister duo. Their names are Hua and DJ. And they were so kind and accommodating to us that, you know, I think that we see a future of more food drives and fundraisers with them. And we hope that you will support their um, uh, small business. They're right there in the Woodbridge um, area. So on Monday, we actually... Uh, Brought our th drove our three car loads of van loads of food over to Families Forward. They were so excited to see us, and um, they were thankful that we had um, food for them because the summer months is is very uh, sparse. So seeing all the food um, and it's going to be going out to families for the week. They will be collecting, uh, um, pe have people come and collect food for their families. But again, they will, it'll go right at the door. So if ever you want to just donate on your own, it's right down the street on 8 Thomas, right down Bake. And while I'm here, I have one more. Um, so thank you very much, Harvest. Um, one more thing. Uh, we have an event coming up on um, Halloween. This year, Halloween lands on a Sunday. And we would like to do trunk or treat out in our parking lot for our Harvest Kids, ages zero to 18. Um, the only stipulation is they have to wear a costume. Um, so make sure you have a costume on. And we also have uh, a request of all of you, if you would like to participate, decorate your trunks, and um, give out um, goodies for our little kiddos. If you could just let me know, we would love for everyone to participate in that fun event. Thank you. Thank you so much, C. Great job, C, Dwayne, Juliet, Leslie, and all that participated. Thank you so much for that. It, it's so important that we reach out to our community around us, and it's such an example of Christ. So we're so thankful for your, for your leadership in this endeavor. And it was a lot of fun, by the way. And, and, and I hope this is the beginning of a lot more that we do in this category. So thank you for that. So at this time, we want to go into our time of tithes and offering. We want to remind you that this is time for... Uh, the members of this church and the regular attenders. And so if you're visiting with us, we ask that you not feel uh, obligated to participate, but that welcome card, if you could put that in the basket as it, as it comes by, that connect card, that'll be awesome. Uh, we'd appreciate that. So with that, I'll, I'll lift up a prayer for the offering before we start. Father God, we present to you an offering that represents a little bit of what you blessed us with so graciously. And uh, we ask that you are glorified through this giving and that your kingdom is advanced. All glory goes to you, God. In Jesus' name we pray, amen. As the offering bags are going around, let's just sing this song all, above all powers, above all kings. Above all powers, above all kings, above all nature and all all the ways of man. You were here before the world began. Above all kingdoms, above all thrones, above all wonders the world has ever known. Treasures of the earth. There's no way to measure what you're Crucified, laid behind the stone. You live to die, rejoice. 
rejected and alone like a rose trampled on the ground you took the fall you thought of me above, above all kingdoms above all kingdoms above all Go ahead and pray, Harvest. Father, your son is the only one worthy of our worship. He gave everything. Because you thought of us above all, he gave everything. And so we freely give ourselves over to you. But we know that not all will want that. We know that there is a war. We know that when we give full life devotion to you, then the old idols of our life will be angry and they'll rise up against us. So this morning, may your word teach us how to navigate and how to get through these moments when we feel like we're under attack because we follow you because we've decided to give our whole life to you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Morning, Harvest and visitors. Visitors, this is your first time here. My name's Kevin McGill, I'm the, uh, the lead pastor, and we've actually been going through a series called Jesus Now, and uh, that series really kicks off our study through the book of Matthew. And what we've been doing through the series is just really focusing on, especially Matthew has been uh, helping us to focus on the character of Jesus. And we're going to really do that through the entire book of Matthew. Now, the character of Jesus, according to Matthew, is first and foremost presented as God is here. He is God with us. And because he is God with us, what that actually means is that in spite of who we are, in spite of our brokenness, in spite of all of our, all of our faults, uh, God moves past our sin through the person of Jesus and is with us, not only in the first century, but here today. And so then we go to Matthew chapter 2. And Matthew chapter 2 says, okay, now, so now Jesus is with us, right? That God is with us. If Jesus is with us, then what that says is that Jesus is worthy of our worship. The definition of worship could simply be said, the full life devotion to another. 
full life devotion. And, and what that basically means is, look, first, we need to worship something. Like, like that is how we're designed. That's how we're wired. We have to give ourselves over to something. Um, and if I'm going to give who I am and all that I am in my entire life and in my entire resources and in my energy and my passion and my very soul, then that person better be worth it. So in Matthew chapter 2, it's demonstrated that Jesus is absolutely worth it. Because what Matthew does in, uh, in Matthew chapter 2, uh, he first holds up King Herod. And he says, see, see King Herod, this guy is not worth it. You're not going to give your entire life over to King Herod, but Jesus is worth it. King Herod's a tyrant. And see, you have to understand, tyrants take more than they can give. But Jesus gave you everything. And if you're going to give full life devotion to anyone, why not Jesus. So that's where we come to today. We now recognize that first that Jesus is God with us. And the second thing is that Jesus is worthy of our worship. And so for those of us disciples of Jesus, you've decided, okay, I'm giving all of this to Jesus, all of who I am to Jesus, full life devotion. Do you think that the tyrants of your life are going to be okay with this? Do you think they're going to be fine? Do you think those individuals that you used to give yourself over to, we would call them idols, will not move into tyranny and demand your allegiance back? Of course they're not going to be okay with it. Of course they're going to fight you to the very end. And the truth is, some of you know this. Some of you know exactly what I'm talking about. You made a commitment a long time ago that I'm going to follow Jesus and you got hammered. And the very truth of it is, is some of you have actually stepped back from following Jesus because you didn't know how to deal with the tyrants that rose up in your life. Maybe it's just the tyranny of doubt. Maybe it's the influences that you had loved and that you had leaned on and the people like your family and friends, suddenly they pushed back hard and they said, look, you follow God or you're with us, but you have to choose. And you begin to wonder if giving your entire life over to Jesus is worth it because look at what I'm losing. Look at what I'm losing. So what Matthew then does, who's a disciple of Jesus and who wrote this book for us, in the early Jewish community, is he says, I know it's going to be hard. So let me tell you what God has for you to get through it. Those of you who have decided to give full life devotion over to God, let me tell you what God has for you. And honestly, it's a thing that sometimes that we skip over and we miss. And it's this, the strong, encouraging word of God. And in the second part of Matthew, it's going to play out in a couple of different ways. First, it's going to be a word from God. But second, something that we, we don't study very often because it's kind of weird and we don't know what to do with it is this, the prophetic voice of God. Meaning he looks into your future and he says, this is what I have for you. I can see, because I'm above time and space, I can see your future. So you have to trust me. So those of us who have decided to give full life Devotion over to God, which you need to know this morning as we get into Matthew chapter 2, is that God's strong, profound voice says, I've got you. I know what you're going through, but I've got you. This will turn out for my glory and for your good. So turn with me to Matthew chapter 2. And we're going to actually start in verse 12. We're going to pick up where we left off. Last week, Matthew chapter 2, verse 12, if you don't have your Bibles with you, uh, the uh, verses will be on the screen behind me. So Matthew chapter 2, verse 12, and it says, and being warned in a dream, specifically, okay, quickly, who's being warned? 
warned, uh, this is actually the wise men. So remember last week, the wise men come all the way from a distant country. These are world leaders. They come before King Herod. And they say to King Herod, who is the one to be born king of the Jews? Basically, they look past King Herod looking for the true king of the Jews. Well, of course, King Herod, who is a born tyrant, doesn't take this very well. And uh, they understand that the, uh, he did not appreciate being passed over for Jesus. And so it says here, and being warned in a dream not to return to Herod, they departed to their own country by another way. So the wise men recognized, okay, we went, we found baby Jesus, we worshiped him, but we're not going to go back to King Herod. That's a mistake. And they were warned in a dream not to go back to King Herod. So they go back another way. And then we come to verse 13. It says, now when they had departed, Behold, an angel of the Lord. Many times we know the role of the angels in the Bible, they're messengers. They're here to tell you something that God has for you. They have a message for you. So that's exactly what we see here. There's a word of God through an angel to Mary and Joseph. And behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to Joseph in a dream and said, Rise, take the child and his mother and flee to Egypt and remain there until I tell you, for Herod is about to search for the child to destroy him. So what do we have here? We have Mary and Joseph, who have given full life devotion to God. Now, Mary automatically participates in full life devotion, but then Joseph has to make this decision. Okay, God, I'm in. I, 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 you know, I have questions, I have doubts, but you know what? I'm going to marry Mary, and I will raise this Christ child. So they give themselves over, and guess what they get in payment for that? A tyrant king that wants them dead. And so what happens? A word from God through an angel is given to Mary and Joseph as a way to say that when we give our full life devotion, when we decide to worship God, he will take care of you. And one of the ways he does it is through a word from him. Maybe an angel, most likely God's word, probably someone from church, but a word will come from him. And it's the word that you need to absolutely hear. Now, thought about this. Sometimes we get a word, right? We're, 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 just, we're just not feeling it. Life is rough. We've sacrificed a lot for ourselves, for our family, uh, maybe for our careers. Whatever the thing is, we need that word. We need that word. And sometimes I, I've recognized this, not all words are equal. Not all words are equal. And uh, a couple of days ago, I was in Starbucks. It was, uh, I think, about six o'clock in the morning. And I was in the Starbucks off of Alton Parkway. You guys have probably been to that one. And so I, I or not Alton, sorry, Jeffrey Road. And I walk into the Starbucks, and this must have come from corporate up in Seattle, but they evidently asked all the Starbucks to put up a little um, poster board with a bunch of uh, uh, little poster board right there. And the poster board uh, reminds everyone first that Starbucks has been around for 50 years, Okay. Just, just kind of a, you know, it's kind of a celebration of what they've done. But then they also ask people to leave a word of encouragement. So they, they left out little uh, stickies and a pen for you to write on to leave a word of encouragement. And you walk, walk in at 6 a.m., you haven't had your coffee, you know it's a long day, and you see that, and you're like, I don't need this right now. <laughs> I don't know if I need a word of encouragement. But then you kind of you lean in. And your heart kind of warms up as you're reading it. And so as I start reading the words of encouragement, and, and I'm like, part of me is like, yes, yes, I need this, but no, th this isn't what I need. So here's the first one that I read. And it said, if you be nice, the universe will reward you with something good. And at first I was like, hey, that's great. If I do good things, then the universe will reward me. It's awesome. Kind of this, this karmic theology, right? If I do something good for the universe, then the universe will do something good for me. Here's the problem with karma. If you're not nice, the universe will reward you with something bad. And I don't need that. 
See, karma says, yes, you do nice things, then the universe will reward you with something nice. You do bad things, then the universe will reward you with something bad. And part of me is like, how about if I do nothing, and then the universe will leave me alone? That's how some of us feel. Universe, just don't know I'm here, and we're all good. So that's not the word I need. I needed at 6 o'clock in the morning. So there's another sticky. The next one says, you are created in the Lord's image. And, and this is written by an individual, written by a human being, and it's a real truth statement. Um, evidently, this person is a Christian, and it was an encouragement for me that there is another person out there on the planet who said, you are created in the Lord's image. And then I remember the 10 pounds I need to lose. <laughs> Am I created in the Lord's image? So I doubt, I wonder, not only my physical appearance, but my, who I am internally. Does this person who is a human being have the ability to look at me and say, you are created in the Lord's image? So we go on to the next one. So in a moment of hypocrisy, I had to write my own. And I wrote, you are not alone. God is here with you and for you. So are we his family. HECIrvine.org. Come check us out. <laughs> so I'm writing this. I'm, oh, yeah, man. Yeah, man. I'll put something out there. Man, no, love it. Maybe they'll stop. Maybe that's why some visitors are here this morning. <laughs> Welcome to Harvest. <laughs> but as I'm writing this, it's not that it wasn't true. It's not that they didn't need to hear this, but then I'm thinking about me as a frail and limited human being, putting a truth statement. What did I really have to offer to the people that were reading this? Did I truly have authority to say these things? And what I realized in that moment is that while we do share encouragement and notes, that are uplifting, and we should be doing that. And I believe the Word of God encouraged us to do this. What we really need, if you've given full life devotion over to God, that you are going to follow Him with your entire life, what you really need is a word from God. That's what you actually need. A direct word from God. Again, I am not dismissing words of encouragement that come from a brother and sister in Christ or just a person that we know, but what you actually need is to hear from God himself. And of course, that's why we come back to the word, and of course, that's why we come back to prayer. We need that constant voice of God in our life directly from him. So what this angel is, is a messenger giving a direct uh, message from God to Mary and Joseph to guide them. That's what you need. And what I want to say to some of you today who, who maybe have taken a step back from your faith, you're not even sure if this is what you, you've signed up for or want to sign up for. I want to ask you, have you kept your ears open to God? Or have you allowed the voices of others to creep in. They mean it. I mean, they mean the best. They mean their best. But is that the only voice that you hear? And my challenge to you is probably one of the reasons you have stepped back from God and you're so overwhelmed by this life is because you've moved away from the voice of God and that's who you need to hear. That's who you need to hear. So here's Mary and Joseph. They've given their full lives over to God. God speaks to them, directs them. They trust God and they do what God says. We come to verse 14 where they obey God and they do what he says. And it says, And he rose and took the child and his mother by night and departed to Egypt and remained there until the death of of Herod. So they did what God told them to do. They went off to Egypt and they waited there until Herod died. Why? Because they knew that they eventually needed to come back home. All right. But then Matthew explains what is actually happening here. There's a lot more going on 
that we understand. It says, this was to fulfill. Do me a favor, if you've got a pen, your Bible open, verse 15, that word fulfill comes up. Underline that. Comes up again in verse 17, fulfilled. Underline that. Comes up again in verse 23, fulfilled. Underline that. All of those are a signal of a coming prophetic statement. That a prophecy is about to happen, okay? So we're gonna remember that. We need to hold on to that as we now move into what is prophecy. So this was to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Okay, so there's this person, prophet, is one of the offices, especially for the Old Testament, is one of the offices in God's kingdom. What did a prophet do? Well, a prophet prophesied. In terms of the New Testament, there were prophets in the Old Testament who would prophesy about things that happened in the New Testament. So, so just to give you guys some simple definitions of what prophecy is, there are really two. The first is foretelling, a prediction of the future. Very simple. We've seen that. We know that. Individuals who claim that they know what's going to happen, that they can stand outside of space and time, and they know what's going to happen. And let's be honest with us, most of us, or let's be honest, most of us in this room are very, very uncomfortable with that. That someone comes along, either a person you know or someone on YouTube, claims they know what's going to happen in the next market cycle or the next presidential candidate or on and on and on. And they're always wrong. And so we are deeply uncomfortable with those kinds of voices. I remember in college, that one guy, he he said he had the gift of prophecy, walked up to a girl. I said, God has told me to tell you that we're supposed to get married. They didn't get married. It was also a terrible pickup line, especially the third time and the third girl he tried it on, right? So when people claim they have a gift of prophecy, we just don't believe them. But the other thing that comes out of it is, what's the role? What's the purpose? Why does it matter that someone can look into my future and say what's going on? We're going to explore that in a second. But we continue, there's a second, there's a second definition, and it's forthtelling. And this one, we probably are not as aware of this definition of prophecy, but it's a communication of a divine message through a person, thus says the Lord. What that basically means is God has asked an individual to speak into your life in regard to what's happening right now and says, hey, I know what you're going through. This is what God has to say about those things. It could be a word of encouragement. It could be a word of correction, whatever it is. Uh, But typically, it's to speak into your life right now, what's happening here today. All right, it's foretelling, foretelling. What we're going to see the second part of the book of Matthew is we're going to see foretelling, a prediction of the future that God can see into your future and knows what's going to happen. So now, what is the prophetic statement? We come to the prophecy. The prophecy is... Out of Egypt, I called my son. So basically, Mary and Joseph are supposed to go to Egypt for a time. And then they're supposed to come back to Judah after Herod's dead to fulfill the prophetic statement of out of Egypt, I call my son. Here's the problem with that prophecy. We have a problem. He's actually not talking about a Messiah that's coming in the future. Go back and read it. It's a very powerful statement. Israel, I know you're in a horrible place, but remember a long time ago when you were in Egypt and you thought all things were lost? I called you out because I love you. I see what you're going through and I will not leave you where you're at. So that was just through Micah, just reminding them of what happened a long time ago. So, Pastor Kevin, out of Egypt, I called my son as Jesus' fulfillment of a prophecy given a long time ago, but the prophecy was actually not about the future. It was pointing to the past. I don't understand what's happening here. Okay, so we're going to get 
just a little nerdy with prophecy for a moment. <laughs> Under foretelling, there are a few more subcategories. One sub subcategory for prophecy is this, typological prophecies. Typological is probably not a word you hear a lot, but typological prophecy basically means a person is a type of something. A person is a type of something. You probably heard it in the Bible, been around the Bible a bit. Uh, Jesus is the new Adam, is a type of Adam. This happens a lot in the Bible, by the way, especially in the book of Matthew. So we're going to put up a, a, a quick chart here, and you'll see it. You probably can't read it from over there, but what you see on the left side are the classic prophetic statements that we know. In the future, a Messiah is going to come somewhere in the Old Testament, that statement's made, and then we see in the New Testament um, that, that that's fulfilled. On the right side is another list where um, somewhere uh, it, it, in the past, a prophet said one thing, and then Jesus fulfilled it as a kind of type. You guys tracking with me? Probably not. All right. So this is what I mean. This is what I mean. We use this language today. When we say something like, something is the new something. Like Y'all have probably heard like, 40 is the new 20, which is not true. It is not at all <laughs> the new 20. 40 is 40, it feels 40. But 40 is the new 20. Or Elon Musk is the new Nikolai Tesla. Or Steve Jobs was the new Henry Ford. Or, now, someone said this. I'm not saying I'm saying it. LeBron, LeBron James. Now, I'm not saying this, okay? Someone said this. LeBron James is the new Michael Jordan. Look, I didn't say it, guys. I'm not the one that said it. I'm just quoting someone else. Is a way to say that Jesus is the new Israel. So what typological prophecy says, specifically in this passage, is that what happened before is happening again. Do you remember a long time ago, Israel, when God saved you out of Egypt? It's happening again. But another thing about typological prophecy, and it's this. What is happening now is better than what happened before. And that's the most important part of it. Let me explain. So back when God saved Israel out of Egypt, he only saved them conditionally. He saved them from some slave masters. He saved them from a very broken situation. But what he did not do was save the sin and the darkness that was in their heart. It was not enough. It was not enough. You guys have heard the stories out of Flint, Michigan, where people are drinking the water and they're filled with carcinogens and their bodies are filled with cancer. And so the solution is, we'll take them out of Flint, Michigan. That's a great solution. What's the problem? The cancer is still in their body. So what's the problem with Israel? The sin is still in them. So what God is saying, out of Egypt, I call my son. In other words, I'm gonna do a greater work. I'm going to save Jesus out of Egypt so Jesus can save us all from our sins. That's the greater work. I'm doing a new thing and it's going to be a better thing. And I think this, this morning why this is important for us guys it's because once again, you guys, God saved you from a particularly terrible situation, bad. Maybe not bad in the sense of what we might hear, some of these you know, stories out there, but you knew the condition that God saved you out of. It was a bad situation. And so you followed Jesus. You said, wow, you did that for my life, I will follow you. And then you're several years in, and you recognize something. I might have been saved out of the situation, but there was something broken in my heart that was never truly addressed. And I'll tell you, as I mature in the faith, I recognize over and over the situation doesn't matter. It's what's going on 
in my heart. You know, this morning I'm, I'm even thinking about our students that are in this room. Maybe you weren't even saved out of something particularly bad. You just knew at one point, maybe in promised land or, or in Amplify, that I think it's time to follow Jesus. But then you were just hit with the tyrants of this world and the idols. And you began to lose grip. You're like, is it worth it? And what you truly want, if you're aware of it or not, what you truly want is God to save you from the darkness that rests in your heart. From the deep insecurities that you feel about who you are as a person. From the, from honestly, maybe sometimes the shame that your faith doesn't, or at least what you believe about the world, doesn't always align with your parents, or maybe here at Harvest. Or maybe, yes, the way my friends live seems to be so great for them. I am drawn to that, and I feel terrible for being drawn to that, the darkness that seems to reside in my heart. And so while you might have committed your life to Jesus, there seems to be another work that you're desperate for. And so the statement comes out to you, but it comes out to everyone that's listening to this. God saved Jesus out of Egypt to do the greater work. The greater work. And that's the truth we need to hear from him. And so we continue. Verse 16. Then Herod, we know Herod's a tyrant. We know he's a tyrant like all the other tyrants. And it says, then Herod, when he saw that he had been tricked by the wise men, became furious, and he sent and killed all the male children in Bethlehem. those things that we've served for far too long and we've decided to cut ourselves off from and are recommitting our life to Christ, they're angry and they chase us and they don't let us go and they create this wave of destruction around us like Herod does. Kill the male children in Bethlehem and in all that region who were two years old or under according to the time that he had ascertained from the wise men. So this man, who has clearly lost his mind, sends his soldiers out just from a couple of wise men who, were, who thought there might be, there's whispers of another king, decides to have all the children under two slain in their houses. And I can't help but to think of the mother's that were holding the bodies, the lifeless, breathless bodies of their two-year-old boys just because Herod was a little jealous because someone worshipped Jesus instead of him. And it feels senseless. It feels senseless. Verse 17, then was fulfilled what was spoken by the prophet Jeremiah. So here we are ready for the next prophetic statement from God. They're experiencing a deep, dark, senseless death, the loss of their children. What would God say to this? What's his response to this? How does this help them through it all? Well, I'll tell you this. I've read this prophecy several times. And I don't understand it. All right, you need that word of encouragement. You need God to walk through, through this with you. And yet here's the prophetic statement. A voice was heard in Ramah, weeping, and loud lamentation. Rachel weeping for her children. She refused to be comforted. Those who refuse to be comforted It's usually because they've experienced something that doesn't make sense. It's wrong. This is senseless. What's the point of this kind of a death? Because 
they are no more. When I read that, I read that and I'm unsatisfied with that, with that prophetic statement. And I think to myself, in my limited view, I want more. I want more from God in this moment when life is where it is today. I need more. And the encouragement for us at this moment is, first, I'm going to say two things. They're going to seem to contradict themselves. First, it's okay to want more. We'll get to that in a second. Second, even this, even this can be a word of encouragement. And this is what I mean. Remember what Brian talked about earlier? Empathy. Empathy meaning to show up in the middle of your pain, and not to come with all of the answers, but to say, I see what you're going through. I'm here. I see what you're going through. This prophetic statement, who first comes from the prophet Jeremiah, is God saying through Jeremiah, hundreds of years before it happens, to the women who lose their sons, I see what you're going through. I am here. Some of the most painful experiences in life is not that, not just that we've experienced pain, but that we're alone in the pain. And to know that the God of the universe can see it all means something. And the second thing, or the other thing I said is a little contradictory, but it's also important. It's okay to want more. It's okay to want more. Let me explain. So when I was preparing this sermon a couple of weeks ago, I came across this passage. And that, while I came across this passage, uh, I learned that a friend of mine had passed away. And it was a bitter death. There was no other way to explain it away. You see, she was 51 years old. She was single. She went to a church that Jenny and I previously attended and wasn't employed, actually, at the school that we were a part of. And here is the deal with, with my friend. She was alone. And she would say it. That she had wanted a family that she had wanted to make a life for herself. She was working at the school because she had a career in mind. She was working hard to move toward that career. She wanted to make a difference, and she struggled to do it up to the age of 51, and then dead. And that already feels senseless. It feels wrong. But, but the thing that truly broke my heart was this. They, had, they didn't know that she had even died for three days because she was living by herself. And it took some of her fellow co-workers to call the police to do a wellness check to realize that she had died three days previous and that no one was there for her. And then I come across this passage where it's like the senseless death. What is the point? And I said, God, I need more. I need to understand. So I decided to go back to the original prophecy, which is always good, by the way. Go back to the original prophecy. So I went back to Jeremiah 31, 15. And it says what we read before. Thus says the Lord, a voice is heard in Rama, lamentation and bitter weeping. Rachel is weeping for her children. She refuses to be comforted for her children because they are no more. That's how I felt. Maybe not as a mother who has lost a child, but as a friend who has lost a friend. This friend is no more. And it doesn't feel right. Something's wrong. But the prophecy continues, which surprised me. It goes on to read, Verse 16, thus says the Lord, keep your voice from weeping. So God says to these women, as God said to me at this moment, stop weeping. 
Now, by the way, in an empathetic situation, don't turn to someone and say, stop weeping. <laughs> Thus says me. Don't do that. God can say that. We don't get to say that. We don't get to say that. But why can God say it? Because he actually knows more than we do. And so the passage continues. And he says, keep your voice from weeping and your eyes from tears. For there is reward for your work, declares the Lord. So he's saying to these mothers, yes, you did give them. You did bring them into this world and you did feed them and you did clothe them. And you imagine for all of your work, they would be raised up and they would live a full life. And that was cut short but there's still a reward. And the reminder to me is there's still a reward for my friend's work. Goes on to say, they shall come back from the land of the enemy. In other words, he's speaking about the resurrection. Their hope, there is hope for your future, declares the Lord, and your children shall come back to their own country. So the word, the prophetic word from God to these people and really to us at this moment is, yes, I do see that you're brokenhearted. I understand, but there's more. There is the resurrection. There is where the entire salvific arc of Jesus coming and dying and rising again. There is more. You will cry that's fine, but the tears will not last forever. There is more. So for those of you who have given full life devotion to God, you're going to experience pain. I don't think I need to argue that statement, but there's more. There's more. And the final part, and we'll close with this, Matthew chapter 2. It's the last prophetic statement. It says, But when Herod died, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared in a dream to Joseph in Egypt, saying, Rise, take the child and his mother, and go to the land of Israel for those who sought the child's life for dead. So it's another word from God through an angel. And he rose and took the child and his mother and went to the land of Israel. But when he heard that Archelaus was reigning over Judea in place of of his father Herod, he was afraid to go there, and being warned in a dream, he withdrew to the district of Galilee. And he went and he lived in a city called Nazareth, so that what was spoken by the prophet might be fulfilled, that we would be called a Nazarene. So basically, an angel says, Okay, it's time to come home. But in coming home through this dream, don't go back to where you were before, go back to Nazareth as a part of a fulfillment of a prophecy made a long time ago. So before Jesus was ever born, God looked into the future and knew exactly how everything was going to work out. And so sends this message to navigate their lives. And the final statement is this, it's that God is in control. God is in control through it all. Through it all. The good and the bad. He is directing our lives, of course, to his full glory, but to your goodness. And that is what we, who have given our lives fully over to God, need to hear. At this time, we're going to participate in communion. And communion is a special way of saying that God is truly in control. He is so in control that he came and died on the cross and rose again. He didn't even leave salvation to us. He did it himself. And so if you've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior, and you celebrate that, we invite you to take communion with us. I'm going to call the men forward as we take communion. And the way that we're going to do this is we're going to invite you to come forward. And what we ask you to do is actually start from the row in the back and to come to the outside up. Come to the men. They will give you the cup. The cup should have the 
juice and the bread. Take that back to your seats, and then we'll take communion. So we will uh, wait a few minutes as everyone comes up to get the elements and sits back down. The Apostle Paul retells the story of Jesus in the upper room with his disciples. He walks us through it. And he explains what took place. The invitation of Jesus for us to do the same thing. So it says in 1 Corinthians 11, verse 24, when he, Jesus, had given thanks, he broke it. And said, this is my body, which is for you. Do this in remembrance of me. In the same way also, he took the cup after supper, saying, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. Do this as often as you drink it in remembrance of me. this time I would like to invite the worship team forward as I pray.
Father, we need your voice. We have walked with you for so long. We've committed so much of our life. And we feel under attack. Maybe it's in the great ways. Or maybe it's just self-affliction. But we feel like we gave everything to you. And the reward is just this pain and this hurt. We know that that's probably not true, but this is where we are right now. We need your voice to guide us through it all. You are outside of time and space. You know what's going to happen. And maybe we don't need everything spelled out. But we need that encouraging word from you. We ask that you guide our steps. That you show us the way. There's this war of worship because we decided to lay down ourselves for you. And the only way we can get through such a war is your strong and mighty voice guiding us. We need you. In the name of Jesus, amen. Things up here, you're looking into. 
back. I'm coming back to the heart of worship, and it's all about you. It's all about you, Jesus. I'm sorry. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his spirits upon you and give you peace. Now let us all go, be a blessing. Have a good week. It's all about.